for all of us. Item B, roll call. Uh, Chair Seth, I am here. Vice Chair Ned, he is excused. Alder Andy. Present. John. Present. Stephanie. Present. Corey. Present. Julia. Present. Cody. Present. And Mark. Present. Alrighty then. Then we'll move on to item C, if we're good. Approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve by Randy? Is there a second? Second. By Mark. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, say nay. All right. And then on to that passes on to item D, approval of the minutes Ooh. from March 17th, moved by Alder Andy. Is there a second? Second. By John. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. And that motion also passes. And then if we're good to go into uh, regular business, um, we have uh, Alder uh, LaFay here um, that um, will queue up the discussion on possible action uh, for the city to consider a ban on new drive-through facilities in 2021 to curb, uh, reduce, as it's written, uh, carbon reductions. So uh, Alder LaFay, I will okay. kick it over to you. Okay, um, I did send uh, some of the things that I found, but um, I do apologize. Uh, I'm looking at some other issues and contact people to contact and that uh, we're dealing right now with my husband has a health issue and our doctor's tests. We're trying to find out what that is. So I, I've been kind of consumed with that, but I don't know if I put this one, the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy, their energy efficiency and renewable energy report. It says right in here that personal vehicle idling wastes about 3 billion gallons of fuel, generating around 30 million tons of CO2 annually in the United States. And, and also there was in the paper, um, the Press Gazette just recently, um, and it was a CO2 levels highest in over three years. So this is stuff that I think we got to get serious about. And we do have a lot of drive throughs and it looks like the city's trying to put some more in. You know, some of it made sense during the, uh, the COVID, the main, you know, when it was really bad. Um, I know the first time in COVID that I went through a McDonald's uh, drive through I don't go very often. And so, because they were closed inside, I will, when I go to any restaurant or, you know, store, I park and I walk in, I've, I've always done that. And that's what we think we got to get back to. Um, so I think we're getting, once we get over this COVID too, we don't need drive throughs Fast food is, eh, I don't know, you can go in and order it and you can eat it right away. Uh, I don't think we need all these drive throughs uh, We're becoming addicted to that and to our vehicle. And also I found that uh, an idling car puts out 10% more um, carbon than um, a running car. And sometimes we, you know, when we stop at a gas, um, at a stop and go light, well, we have to idle, we have to keep the car running. But otherwise, um, even when I go to um, the, when I go to my Bands, there's a line, I turn my car off because I'm not going to sit there let it idle. But not just that, because I also have a condition. Uh, my doctors can't figure out why, but when I went through my chemo, I have a hyper, hyper sense of some smells. Car emissions. In the summer, I have to turn my air, I have to put my air on inside air only, close my windows, everything. I can't stand it. Fumes are, make, can almost make me sick. And even today, uh, I noticed waiting at some of the places, waiting for the lights, um, the smell. I can smell it right away. I can smell my furnace when it runs. Um, and there might be other people that are very sensitive to the smells also. So 
there's a lot of issues, I believe, with it. And I think I also had sent you that some of the cities have their program, Stop Idling, Start Saving. Um, and then um, also the, the cities that have banned um, the new drive throughs And uh, I have an email to the mayor in Milwaukee, the Madison mayor, and I wanna to send to Appleton and some other cities and see if they are looking in this issue. But I think if we want to um, meet our goals, I think the state has, if we wanna meet these goals, we need to look at everything that we can do to reduce these carbon emissions. Thank you. Uh... Alder Lafay. Uh, Melissa, is there another city staffer here to speak to this provision or to this proposal? Uh, yes, there is. Um, I invited Dave and Paul from our planning department. Yep. <laughs> I'm here. I'm Dave. Hello. I'm Paul. Hi, Dave. Hi, Paul. Welcome. I'll kick it over to you guys then. Um, well, I, I don't, Paul, do you want to speak first or you want me to? Well, well I just thought we were here as a, as a resource because we've recently, through the council, adopted some new drive through requirements that really speak more to the functionality of drive throughs, not so much the purpose of them. But, uh, you know, our department handles zoning as well as economic development. So I think we're just here to, to answer questions from uh, uh, the land use side, so to speak. But, uh, Dave, I don't know if you would want to step in well, as well. I guess I jump in a little bit from an economic development standpoint. Um, drive throughs, even um, kind of hybrid drive throughs, have been very attest to that. We had, we've had probably many drive throughs come through every year. Um, none of our neighboring communities have any type of a ban. So, again, from an economic development perspective, um, that will put us at a disadvantage for attraction. As Kathy had kind of mentioned, as Alder Lefebvre had mentioned, you know, during COVID, it really jumped up where a lot of people were more interested in drive-throughs than anything else, um, mainly because the dining rooms were all closed. Um, and hopefully that is uh, letting up a little bit. Um, but um, so there, there is that as well from that perspective. Our drive-through regulations are pretty limited where they're allowed by right. Um, in our zoning code already. And we have, although those have been changing recently, Paul's been uh, working on those, um, they're pretty regulated as well. I mean, we have some pretty good provisions in there. Um, so I just wanted to give you kind of that perspective. Um, I'm no environmental scientist or anything like that. Um, so I probably know enough to be incredibly dangerous <laughs> with what I say. But um, so I'm just here as well to, to answer any questions um, that you might have. Um, I have a question, maybe this is for you, Kathy, or, or Dave mm -hmm. or Paul. Um, you, Kathy, you said you reached out to Madison and Milwaukee to see if they have this ban or do they have this ban? What other cities have done this? What is the precedence for this or would this be? Uh, um, I sent it on the thing, it was okay. It started with, uh, someone told me about Minneapolis. And Minneapolis put their final ban in uh, for the whole city. New, I'm talking about new drive throughs okay? Because we can't control, I guess, once we have allowed others with drive throughs we can't take it away. But this is all new ones. And then, um, so I went online and I just put in uh, cities banning uh, drive throughs And I came up with uh, Fairhaven, New Jersey. I cannot pronounce it. It's the French one. C-R-E-V-E. C, then a capital C, O, U, E, R, Missouri, Long Beach, California, South Los Angeles, California. That's what I found so far. That's why uh, I did reach out to these other ones. And I'm sorry, it was just more recent and I haven't heard best if they were, you know, looking into considering something like this. And I, I put down, you know, the cities that have already uh, done the bans and why. And like I said, um, I think it's Ohio, they're doing the um, stop idling, uh, save uh, money, save money. But it's also 
they don't want the the carbon emissions. It's different. States are doing some things, and cities are doing things. Um, another question I have. So if, if this is going to be a ban starting or, or just containing the year 2021, will this impact any businesses that are currently trying to uh, get a drive through um, that are you know, going through the, the permitting process or, or have plans to expand or add a drive through, especially while COVID still uh, goes on uh, in this part of the state. I know there's one, it's being held up because the neighbors are um, don't want the drive through. They feel it's a hazard. It's on Main. The, um, yeah, that uh, actually, is that beer? Like, that's 901 Main. Uh, he's not doing a drive through there any longer. I think he's got a different tenant. But um, from my perspective, and, and Paul does more of the present zoning and, and that kind of development stuff. Uh, but I've been talked with quite a few property owners, um, generally in more of our auto oriented corridors like Military Avenue. Um, so there's a, an example is there's a redevelopment in process for like the Green Bay Plaza with Sears. Um, their plan shows the potential for maybe an additional three or four drive throughs on that lot as out lots, um, you know, around the outside parking lot. Um, I have talked to several people looking to do drive throughs Usually if there's any type of coffee shop or fast food type of restaurant, they definitely want drive throughs Banks increasingly um, have drive throughs um, rather than lobbies. Um, so again, I don't do the present stuff, but sort of the, some of the future discussions I've had with property owners and business people in town, um, if it went into effect, it could affect those future plans if there was a ban. Now, depending if it was a sunsetted ban, you know, if it was a 12 month or I'm not sure, you know, um, it might just hold them off, I guess, uh, but probably put us in a, they would probably go somewhere else, this, I guess would be my point. And then I don't know if Paul wants to address sort of anything we got in the works right now. Yeah, we have a couple of drive throughs that are pending, um, one on East Mason Street, and, I'm, and the other one would be Popeye's, uh, the old spot location. Um, you know, in cases like this in the past, I recall that moratoriums are used. Um, they're kind of a stopgap measure to allow for staff to do more analysis, I guess. But I think you'd have to convince the council that it would be a good idea to do this moratorium. I don't think that's a permanent ban. It's just more of a temporary hold, so to speak, but, um, you know, that might have to go through our planning commission and ultimately the council would have to sign off on that, but they might want some justification, some reasoning behind that. And that's where you might see the collision of the uh, economics versus the, uh, the environmental side. Can I? Yeah, and as I had kind of mentioned before, I'm, I am no environmental scientist, but I would wonder if the emissions from starting and stopping and a car idle to go around to pick the stuff up, mm -hmm. what the comparison would be to a car idling at an average amount of time that you stay in a drive through I mean, I think that's the kind of stuff that um, council would probably want us to dig into. Um, I, I don't know how, how much of an improvement that would be, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Actually, the research shows that it's uh, it's worse to idle. You're, you're wasting more gas. You're putting more carbon out to idle than to stop it and start it. It's worse. Yeah. If you, uh, yeah, like said, there, there no, are sites that no you can go on. I have yeah. no environmental science. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just want to bring that up. And <laughs> in, in some, actually, some cities, they actually have signs when you go into a drive through it says no idling. That's I found out too, and I, I can't remember which cities, but no, they'll have signs, no idling. You are to, if you're waiting in line, you turn your car off. I guess that's another one. And I thought it was interesting, the mayor at the council, he met, he talked about um, the parklets, you know, that we're looking and putting those in. And he's talking about more pedestrian walkability. And then also I was at traffic and they, they were talking about pedestrian walkability. We're, we're, uh, 
I think that's what we've been talking about in the city. We want people talking and walking more instead of uh, driving all over and idling your car. You used to do that. You used to park, walk down town of uh, Washington Street to the other. You didn't drive all over. You didn't idle your car. I, I think we got to get back to that. But I think the thing is what I'm really concerned about is the C CO2, the carbon emissions, that um, if we want to be serious about our goals to reduce carbon emissions, to help with climate change, we have to be serious. We can't say, oh yeah, we believe in it, and then we don't do it. what's right. Sorry, that's my, my take on it. Thank you, uh, Alder. Uh, Julia, you have your hand up. Um, I was just gonna, just a couple of points. This isn't like, this is, I, I didn't know that. First of all, I just didn't know that this was a thing in other communities. That's really interesting. Um, but um, Alderman Lefebvre is correct. Like idling is very bad like just even small amounts of it are much worse than turning off your car and on. Um, so it's it's like one of those myths that you think that you're turning on your car actually produces more carbon emissions. I think um, there's a really big public health component to this too. Um, so if you think of like schools where parents are picking up kids and idling, there's actually a large air quality issue. I think probably more like that for them. So the, it's not just environmental, like, for the environment and CO2 or economic development stuff, but it's definitely a public health thing. And then if you're looking at some of these other cities that are doing these, it's really not just, you know, for CO2, it's wrapped into trying to reduce fast food chains and um, walkability, obesity issues and public other public health issues too. So it's part of like a bigger strategy to make your community more um, and more and just healthier in general too and the carbon emissions so I don't know if they're just if they're if these communities I think one thing would be interesting you know you have drive-throughs for pharmacies too um, so I just don't and there are obviously accessibility issues uh, that you, we want to make sure we think about too um, but just some other extra points or yeah relative related to this. Mark? Um, I, I was just wondering, uh, Dave or Paul, um, whether we could reach out to the um, county MPO, the planning transportation guys and ask about emissions and what kind of effect um, idling at, um, contributes to emission issues. We're a non as I understand it, green, is Green Bay still a non-attainment zone for for CO and sulfur and nitro, nitrous oxides or not in that uh, area. I mean, I know that, that, that this area has historically had uh, emission issues and I'm not sure if that's still, still something that's considered to be a major um, source or, around here. But nonetheless, I mean, I think they have the people who can speak to this more specifically than you guys might be able to from that standpoint, at least. Um, uh, and, you know, just a, a quick comment. I was actually in Minneapolis this weekend. They may have banned drive through fast food, but they have drive through liquor stores that we don't. So, um, you know, they're, yes, we they're they've got other issues that we <laughs> they may want to address. <laughs> we do. <laughs> right, Randy? I guess, I guess we would, we would, you know, if this were to go forward with staff doing re more research on it, if that was the council decided to do, um, yeah, we would definitely reach out to the metro areas, maybe regional planning. I don't know if um, Bay Lakes does any, any of that kind of work. They do more environmental stuff. Um, yeah, and every, I guess every resources we could to, to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, it is out of my wheelhouse for sure. Can't speak for Paul. Oh, Randy's. Yeah, uh, I, I think at this kind of this juncture, I'd, I'd be more looking to in favor of a of an idle ban than a, than a, a drive through ban. I'm still a little concerned about. I mean, we're not through COVID yet, and and we could end up with a third wave, and who knows what. I mean, I yeah. I really think uh, drive throughs have been kind of a <laughs> uh, uh, saved a lot of businesses or been a lifeline for a lot of businesses, and I'm just not sure going forward. 
about banning drive-throughs. Just yet, I, I I think if we could take some other steps like an idle idle ban, that seems, and that would not only be drive-throughs. That you know, if we'd have that citywide, uh, like uh, you know, there's lots of instances where people are idling, as mentioned, like with picking up kids from from uh, school and stuff. You know, that might actually do a lot more to uh, reduce our emissions than than the actual drive-through ban. So. I think an idle ban, uh, I'd like to maybe steer us more that way and investigate that and follow that than, than a, a drive-through ban. My, think, my, my thinking on it. John and then Melissa. I just wanted to add that I, I agree with Randy. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm concerned we're still not out of COVID. Um, I'm also concerned about, in, uh, economic impact, and I I think this on the idle ban, uh, you'll get a bigger bang for your buck by focusing on behavior change within the city for all drive-throughs rather than targeting the, the few that we know that might be coming up. Um, but I certainly, I would still need to see the science on that before I'd be willing to weigh in anymore. Melissa? Um, I was just gonna offer a note from a, from a staff perspective um, and, and as an FYI, it's my understanding that the city does have a pol an anti-idling policy for fleet vehicles. Um, at least like within Department of Public Works, there is, I spoke with the fleet manager um, just a couple of weeks ago, and he reiterated that. Um, so it's, um, there's many, many fleets that, that have that and many companies that have anti-idling anti policies, just you know, private companies that do that as well um, from a gas savings perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that. Oh. Yeah, I want to hop in here too and sure. give my two cents about, um, you know, the concerns with COVID that um, Alder Randy and uh, uh, John raised. I mean, feels like we're, we're getting close to the end of this thing, but we are not there yet. Um, and I think, speaking personally, I haven't dined in a restaurant in more than a year. I don't plan on it uh, for many more months. I love Culver's too, so I'm gonna hit up that drive through every chance I can get. That's just wanna be very transparent about that. Um, but I think starting looking at a, a ban, uh, new drive throughs right now, just, just doesn't make sense with where we're at in the pandemic uh, in regards to our safety and supporting local businesses. I do, however, think this is a really good thing to look into and to raise are causing climate change and automobiles and idling and, and think behaviors like this are um, a part of a big impact. Um, I, would, I would like to think about it a little bit more bigger picture though, and seeing this as just a piece of all of the emissions um, that are being uh, released in the city and in the area. I know I've been talking and working a lot with John and, and Ned and uh, Melissa and, and talking with the mayor about how we go about developing a comprehensive climate action plan to help us hit 100% clean energy by 2050. And this is a part of it. Um, through ban, I, I don't think would be um, as strategic as considering this along with all the others as we go through, uh, you know, hopefully more robust planning process to, to try and hit those goals. So I think, you know, as we think about this, I would like to, um, do a little, I think there, regardless of what we decide, there's more research that needs to be done, but to, to kind of bring this perhaps to the clean energy, like working group uh, or, or to staff working on this and, and have this be a part of the bigger picture of how we reduce uh, carbon at the community scale. Um, so I think uh, Kathy and, and Randy, you had your hands up, right? Uh, right. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Kathy. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I can tell you, Seth, you don't have to go through the drive through at Culver's. <laughs> you can put your mask on, you go inside, order, and you can sit outside or take it in your car because I just took my grandparents help me on the weekends. <laughs> you don't have to go through the drive through But another thing, yeah, and my, my coffee shop. 
what? Drive through is what I'm most comfortable with during the pandemic. So okay, all right, all right. Uh, okay, I'm I'm fully vaccinated and everything, so I wear my mask. I feel comfortable just walking in and could do it. And I've done that uh, all along through the uh, when the attic reopened, the attic coffee shop. I go in. I mean, they their setup is great. I don't think anybody could feel uncomfortable going in there during the COVID, uh, the way they got it all set up. But I go in and I order my coffee and they never considered, I don't even know if they might have trouble doing the drive through but they never considered it and they had no problems. People go in there and no problems having the drive through So I really don't, I don't know why all these places have to have drive throughs I think we're, we're too wedded to our cars I, to me, car, a car is a necessary evil, and I only t use it when I really have to. <laughs> so, and I combine all my trips. So, I really try to be, you know, as, as environmentally, you know, responsible and do things that I thought was right. But yeah, you're right. You know, maybe the anti idling um, could be a program that we could look at because I'm concerned about the um, the carbon emissions coming out. If we want to be serious about Meeting our goals, um, I think the state does have a set goal that they're looking at. And so I think we need to be part of that that um, equation too, to look into that. And, and we could cities that if we do want to do something like this idling band or idling, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, if we do something like that, we could put up like they do at the different uh, drive throughs There's a sign saying, you no know, idling. That's the only thing we could do to really, you know, to make this effective. All right, we have Randy. Okay, I, I just wanted to add, you know, with the, the I, I like to follow the idling, um, but I'm also curious, I'd like to know uh, that uh, places that have done this, um, how is it enforced? I mean, I know we've had some issues with certain things in, in the past with uh, the police not being too crazy uh, or, or the alders not being crazy about uh, police enforcement of certain uh, items. I know there was a while back about uh, the police are trying to uh, make a fine for people who uh, leave their keys in their car and they, because they're leaving the car idle uh, in the winter to keep it warm and then uh, the cars are stolen. That's uh, one of the biggest uh, reasons uh, cars are stolen is people have left their keys in the car. And uh, that didn't make it through council. Uh, and, that, and then, uh, you know, with the mask mandate, you know, the enforcement of that was problematic. Uh, so I'd really like to know what, how, how uh, communities are enforcing it. And if, I think it's still something worth to pursue, but maybe not as a ban, but as a, a program or an initiative, or I don't know. I mean, uh, possibly a ban, I'd wanna, I'd wanna look at all those possibilities. I think a scene of any kind is a good idea. Uh, uh, whether it includes a ban or not, I don't know. I'd like to know more about the enforcement end of that as well. So that's all. All right, Corey, Julia, Kathy. I can, I can answer. Yeah, these. you know, I actually was going to make the same point um, about enforcement. Just curious, you know, how that could be done. Um, I think too, you know, there's questions I would have like, you know, is there a certain temperature, like if it's below freezing, can you keep your car idling type of thing or, you know, I think there's a lot of different um, aspects with weather related stuff that could, you know, be um, just, I don't know, problematic maybe in, in trying to enforce that as well as, I mean, I've, seen people like leave their pets in the air conditioner running you know on a hot day if they have a dog in the car or something um in a parking lot so i just think there could be some questions based on like safety for people uh, types of situations but um also just i think kind of wanted to point covid thing i think too not only people using drive throughs but um like Uber Eats or, you know, the uh, food delivery services, I think have probably I, um, increased quite a bit. Um, and I personally, it depends, I, <laughs> I'm no expert on this, um, 
but I could see like where those people used to come into a restaurant and eat. I feel like there's probably more waste with like plastic and things like that. So I think, I mean, that's another contributor to, um, you know, to get the food, people are bringing it to them. So I think, I mean, I, or would we start banning along people to deliver food then and that type of thing too. So I think, I don't know, I, I just think it would be difficult to, um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I think people too, I guess, like convenience. You know, if you got a little kid and you know they're in a car seat or something, I remember carrying those baby carriers around and it's not easy. Um, so I think people like convenience, I think for economic purposes, um, people like drive-throughs. Family um who need accessibility. So um I think that's all I really have for right now. <laughs> I was uh, just kind of piggy or building up. Like I, I guess I kind of agree with some of what Randy and Corey were saying. Um, from a little bit different for terms of, I, I just feel like at least if you do a ban, you have a backfire effect and more unintended consequences and a backlash than it's positive. Just like the sound of it, people like love their cars. So and you're. And that would just not, I just, from a marketing perspective, I think that would be a bad behavior. We might have a worse behavior happening, <laughs> right? um, but I like anti-idling campaign. Like that sounds kind of nice. That rings a bell, um, I guess. And then the other thing I, I was just going to say, um, and so I guess generally we should just be really careful about how, what we decide and how it, or that we're making these decisions for p other people. But I really don't want this to get lost. I, just listening, you know, it's a lot about carbon and we're talking about a climate plan. I really, there's like, this is a serious public health. Like we do not have that great of air quality here. And I mean, we have kids with asthma and people with asthma and mm -hmm. this, just the idling alone, like could really actually improve air quality in this area. And so I think moving forward with our climate stuff too, not just think about it from this environmental carbon reduction. I really think we should not forget about the public health impacts because that's what's going to that's a, like one of the best benefits of us doing this work too so i don't want that to get lost in the future um i just want to jump in and agree with a lot that has been said from the different um points of view um, and I like the long-term picture that's about really trying to reduce, um, you know, and have this this work towards that big plan. Um, I think, and I agree with Julia, I do like the um, idea of trying to work this in a positive way and um, through many different elements because there's that public health benefit. I also hear about walkability, um, a lot of my family are really big on biking around town. So increasing that in a way, you know, these there's a lot of elements that we can consider in an anti-idling ban um, and different ways that we could implement this. I think um, that doesn't require police enforcement or anything like that. Um, but I think we could get creative with it um, too. So, I think this is a really great conversation and I'm excited to hear more about, you know, what other cities and towns and states are looking at doing or have done um, and having further conversations about, you know, how we can reduce some carbon emissions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, I want to say, um, yeah, the idling ban, okay, would be you need a campaign. You need to get out to the public and you state like this one, stop idling, start saving. It says idling is expensive. It's it's a poster that they did. I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> see the whole thing. Idling is expensive, up to a gallon or more of fuel per hour, depending on vehicle size. Idling pollutes. A gallon of fuel creates about two, uh, 20 pounds of greenhouse gases. Idling threatens health. 
Breathing uh, vehicle emissions increases the risk of respiratory respiratory illness. So there is a can there's campaigns out there. This is I can maybe I can send um, Melissa a, a link to this. It's cleancities.energy.gov slash slash files. It's a big long thing, but you, you can get um, some of their information. So there are cities that are already working on this. And I think that's something that maybe that we should look at because it's the carbon emissions and the other related things with, it can save money. I think if you get put that across that people, you can save money by not idling your car all the time. And this I think helps uh, more people will buy into that. Then you can do some of the other things too. People that are concerned about the carbon emissions that we have and you know the climate change, and then about the health. But um, there are three points, the very good points, I think that people could, um, could uh, look into. Yeah, yeah, okay, this makes sense. And then, like I said, what some of the cities do, they actually have signs posted when you go into your drive-through right before it says, no idling. And I don't have the points on there, but it says no idling. So this is, um, I think, a good way we can start with a campaign. You have to, you know, start that get to buy into it, to get into it, and then you do the, uh, you probably do the signs. You don't want to do the signs right away, and then people say, "Well, what is this?" You know, I don't understand. And um, but you got to educate people first. I we've uh, this kind of like to me sounds very not i mean we, we brought up the whole uh recycling the plastic bags thing last time and so i mean what are we for this like for this commission and with the city i mean what is capacity to start a pro programs like these or how how does the, do these kind of things happen in other parts for other issues or if we were interested in starting maybe like a clean air campaign where this idling is one facet of clean air in the city, which would probably be a lot couched much, people would understand that a lot more easily or be okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, yeah, if we like wanted to do something like that or understand what I'm asking. I'd like to propose a motion. Um, <laughs> Uh, that we refer this to staff. Merry Christmas, Melissa. Oh, this makes <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think a, a clean air campaign. I kind of like that uh, all together. To come, uh, if we could uh, do some research as to uh, what other communities have done for a clean air campaign, what a clean air, clean air campaign consists of, and, and uh, what we could do to start working with that. And even, uh, uh, I don't know how much time you'd like for this. Uh, you know, it's not something... Um, I don't know at all. But I'd leave it to you as to what kind of date you'd like to report back to us on that. But if well, I mean, just in full disclosure, I'm not a I'm not an air quality specialist. Um, my background is not in air quality, so um, you know, to refer to staff, um, I don't know of anyone on our staff that has that expertise. Um, so I don't know, you know, where that would go necessarily, if it would go anywhere. Um, would I could see this comment? potentially, you know, partnering with like a public health department or something like that. Um, just to bring it back, though, we do have a motion on the agenda. So I, Seth, I, I think we should take action on the motion that's on the agenda first before we move on. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Um, so the the motion on the agenda would be, I think we would need to come back to an idling ban to have a separate discussion on that, um, put that on the agenda, and I think think through it a little bit in terms of what that would look like, especially with capacity. So the item on the agenda is the ban on drive throughs So if we want to have a motion, it should pertain to that, so. Well, then I would make the motion to receive and place that on file. All right, so there's an implying your withdrawing your original motion to replace it with receiving place on file. Is there a second? I'll second that. It's nice to see that Randy's not been sitting idly though. <laughs> I thought a little idle band meant I couldn't daydream. 
Awesome. Um, all right, motion by Randy, second by Mark. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed, say nay. All right, so that's been received and placed on file. Seth, can I can I make a suggestion? If you are you know interested in looking into the idling thing, um, I can I can do more research and, and find the contacts of the people, the cities that have done this or states are doing this, these idling programs, and I could send that uh, to Melissa, and then you know so that you can see what others are doing. You can see exactly how they're setting up, so we don't have to invent. Uh, you know, the wheel, it's, it's already been done on some other areas. So it might help. Yeah, I think that'd be super helpful. And I mean, you know, to go back to my point before, you know, we want to get a little more serious about developing a community wide climate action is a huge component of it. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, to really look at all aspects of idling and, and drive throughs as we make really be intentional about getting community feedback. So we avoid uh, that potential backlash would be um, big. And that that just fits in a little bit more with, uh, you know, the existing capacity and priorities in a little more holistic way. Okay. So appreciate you bringing this to us, uh, Alder Lafay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so do you, need a, do you need someone to make a motion for that or do I just send the stuff over to Melissa? You can just send it over, I think. Okay, okay. And then you, you're gonna discuss it at the next one. Okay. Oh, okay, that helps. <laughs> and I have to get ready. I got a Brown County uh, board meeting. Uh -huh. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, giving me time on this and you guys, you know, looking into it. We have to all be re responsive. <laughs> you can't just do the talk. You got to do the walk. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and thanks uh, Dave and Paul for hopping on for that part of the agenda too. Appreciate your insights. More than welcome, thank you. All right, then uh, on to uh, item two of regular business uh, for consideration and possible action. We have a resolution on the city of Green Bay joining the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition and uh, setting or I guess reaffirming via resolution our 100% clean energy goal. So Melissa, I will let you uh, speak to this. Okay, thank you. Um, so in your packet was a copy of the draft resolution. So hopefully everyone had time to look that over. Um, I In past meetings, I've talked a little bit about um, our involvement with the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition, which it's a new group. Um, we started about four or five months ago, it was shortly after I started in this role and um, its current membership is, you know, there's no fee to join or anything like that, but in a nutshell, what it is, it's, it's a, co uh, a coalition of, as of the moment, City of Madison, City of Milwaukee, Eau Claire, La Crosse, Racine, Green Bay, and the counties of Dane and Milwaukee. And it's um, the people that are involved with it are the sustainability coordinators and directors and resiliency coordinators of those communities. So it's not uh, the local elected official doesn't sit on on the coalition. It's it's staff driven. And the primary goal is to um, affect state policy through the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin by um, offering comment and feedback on dockets that are up for, um, for public comment. So for instance, a couple of months ago, there was a docket on parallel generation rates and basically how that can affect cities. And as a coalition, we made joint comments on that. And I run those comments, it, there, we, collaboratively come up with the comments. Um, and then each city has the decision to see if they wanna sign on to that or not. That's how we've been doing it up to this point. Um, so I work with the law department and the mayor on showing them the joint comments saying, you know, is this, is this okay? Is this, you know, do you approve of this? And so that's been my role in drafting some of those comments. 
Um, this resolution firms up the membership of the city of Green Bay in that coalition. And it also gives the resiliency coordinator authorization to continue to make comments on PSC documents. Again, I would be working directly through the law office on any of those things, but it just firms up, um, it firms up that commitment to climate change. Um, I'm gonna show my, I'm gonna attempt to show my screen so you can see um, some of the guiding principles of, of the group. Um, and we are trying to get more cities now that we're a little bit more solidified with the goals of the group, we're actively recruiting other communities as well. So I've reached out to the city of Appleton and the city of Oshkosh um, to their mayors to see if they would like to be involved as well. Um, so let me try to share my screen. Um, and hang on with me. And tell me if you can see that. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. It's um, a small. Is okay, I'll try to make it, I'll try to enlarge this. Um, there. Okay. So hopefully that's a little bit better. I'm not gonna read through all of this, um, but this in bold that the members, meaning the government entities have come to understand that climate change poses severe risks to our communities and we cannot avoid the worst effects without effective state policy. So we're really trying to influence policy changes within the PSC and the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin is the regulating body for all utilities in Wisconsin, whether that's electric, natural gas, or water utilities, um, and even like cable and, and telecommunications as well. Um, so some of the things that we support are increased funding on ener for energy efficiency, clean energy choices. A big one is equal and affordable access to renewable energy. Um, opportunities for um, communities to increase resource efficiency for in construction and retrofit projects. So really affecting even like state building codes um, to affect it from that perspective as well. Um, and then continued funding opportunities and incentives that um, municipalities can continue to use to improve energy efficiency and renewable energy. And really what's driving all of this is all of the communities that are in this group have climate climate goals. Um, some of some of the communities like Madison and Milwaukee and Eau Claire are much much further ahead with those goals, and with having you know more staff on board working towards those goals, they have codified climate action plans, and that's where we want to go um, as a community as well. Um, so we do data sharing and we collaborate with each other as well. So um, that's kind of the basis for for the city's involvement with this group. So what I'm asking for um, this evening is that the sustainability approve the, the resolution that you have in your packets um, to um, go forward with the membership in the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition. And with that, if you have any questions, Um, I, I would just say, I, I, mean, I think I would, I would support this. I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, Green Bay shouldn't be the, the follower we always have been on climate issues. Um, so the more we can do to move, move ourselves forward, the better. So I would, uh, I would make a motion that we, we approve of this resolution and send it to council uh, with one change and your last further be it resolved um, paragraph. <clears throat> it call it says the Wisconsin Public Services Commission. It's the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin, and the only reason I point that out is because WPS Power always went by Wisconsin Public Service, and it gets confusing. Um, in the second to last 
the last, be it further resolved in the last two lines, it says, uh, investigations and other proceedings before the Wisconsin oh, yes. Public Service. Yeah, it should be Public Service Commission of Wisconsin. Okay. It should be carbon reduction goals with an L. Yes. Yes, I see that. All right, let me get back to my civic clerk screen, guys. Hang on a sec. Okay, Mark, you initiated that? Seconded by Randy? Okay. And is the motion to, to pass with the amendments or just to amend? Um, pass with the amendment. Okay. Cool. And then your hand up discussion before we move to a vote. There we go. I'm just curious uh, what like the feasibility of this, has this been done before in other communities, you know, within that time frame, or is this, um, right. you know, is this uh, something, has the goals <laughs> been set, um, you know, modeled off another community or municipality or state or something who's done it? I'm just curious. The goals are modeled right. after the state of Wisconsin. State of Wisconsin has this timeline as well. Okay. Is, you know, carbon neutrality, carbon neutral by, by 2050. Okay. Um, yeah. Or 2040, I think the resolution says, doesn't it? There are a number of communities that have made commitments to 2030, 20, yeah. 2050 is 40. what ours says, yeah. And the goals, the commission has uh, set the 100% goals, putting it in the resolution really, you know, firms it up and makes it be so the mayor has made a 2050 commitment as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, like city of Wauwatosa, Madison, Dane County, Eau Claire City County School District, La Crosse County, City of La Crosse. Um, a num a, I'm forgetting some, and there are also some other communities that are like at least as a city like River Falls already at 100% clean energy. So that's a very, very consistent. Um, I think a lot of folks in the environmental world would say 2050 is not soon enough. So we could have that conversation too. But. It's also actually uh, w, uh, Wisconsin Energy Corporation, the, the parent company of WPS and We Energies, has made a commitment to 100% carbon neutral electricity by 2050 as well, as has XL Energy um, in Western Wisconsin, and I think Alliant Energy in the Madison area and MG&E as well. So. I think that sounds great. Um, with that, is there a, what kind of like financial commitment by the city to achieve that? Does anybody know, or is is it more, um, you know, is it would it be would the city of Green Bay have to help fund the efforts? Well, and are they or? You mean well? I mean, this is our this resolution supports the city's involvement with the coalition, but then it also reaffirms the city's goal of getting to carbon neutrality. So um, there isn't a budget set aside, but that's part of what the climate group is working on, you know, within the sustainability commission, as well as myself with climate action measures. So they're really, to answer your question, Corey, no, there's not specific money set aside for the city of Green Bay to do this, but it's it's really, we're talking like institutional changes, how we source light bulbs, how we replace HVAC units when they fail, what type of insulation is put in in a building, um, putting renewable energy on, you know, available land space buildings. I mean, it's, this is sort of the first step is setting the goal. 
And then all of the other things that the committees that this commission's already done with ben with energy benchmarking and carbon ben benchmarking, I mean, all of that's part of sort of the pathway to get there. This just makes it a little bit more public. Okay, thanks for the explanations. Okay. <laughs> it's definitely not in my wheelhouse, this type of thing. So I appreciate the information. Other discussion before we move to a vote? John, you're off mute. Were you gonna say something? Uh, shoot, I thought you were gonna say something cool about clean energy. Um, well, cool. Uh, we can move it to a vote then. Um, if we're all good to go, uh, Mark's uh, motion to pass with the amendments. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right, and that passes. Thank you, Melissa. This is a really exciting uh, group and good to see our commitment uh, go uh, into a resolution. And then, so will this go to, what's the next step for this resolution then, Melissa? Um, it will be on the agenda of the May 4th Common Council meeting. Awesome. With, with the sustainability report, um, anything that we take specific action on will be in that sustainability report to council. So um, yeah, it goes, that's where the next stop is. That's great, thank you. Um, then we'll move on to uh, item three, then um, discussion with possible action regarding sustainable landscaping and land use, a uh, couple blocks that way um, at East River uh, Emily Park. Um, Melissa, I'll uh, kick this over to you since Ned, uh, who requested this, is not here tonight. Yes, and um, I replied, so my recommendation at this point, um, since Ned Asked this to be asked for this to be on the agenda, but is not here to present. My recommendation is to hold it to the next meeting. Make a motion to hold. Motion to hold by Elder Andy. Is there a second? Second. By John. Any discussion before moving to a vote? Um, I'm just looking to see if there's actually a motion to hold. Oh, there it is. Sorry. All righty, all those in favor then say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All righty then. We'll move on then to uh, item F, informational. Uh, we've got an update on the bench contest and the plastic bag uh, challenge with trucks. Melissa, is that you? Is that Mark? Do you have the update? Uh, that is Corey, I believe. Corey. All right, take it away. Sure. Yeah, so um, as far as the next Trex challenge, um, which I missed the last meeting, so I wasn't part of that initial discussion. Um, but so I think most of you are familiar with it. Uh, the idea is to collect uh, 500 pounds of plastic film within a six month period and to um, then you can get a bench made out of trucks material which is made from the recycled plastic. And so I did a little research. I contacted the city of De Pere who um, been doing it and it sounds like they've been successful with it. They're planning to continue it. Um, so we thought it would be great for the city to go ahead and give it a try too. Um, so the parks department is going to kind of take the lead on starting this. I don't know exactly when it's going to start, but we're going to be um, filling out the forms and things. So I, I'm not quite certain when the six month window will be, in, but um, we're planning to have a collection site at City Hall and then at the Bay Beach Wildlife Sanctuary and using those two sites as kind of the kickoff collection spaces. Um, so from there, we're going to take it and weigh it. And um, with the county is actually Mark uh, is letting us because it's a more precise measuring tool. 
Um, and then we'll actually be taking it to festival where it'll be distributed from there to um, the recycling, wherever it goes from there, I guess. <laughs> so that's the process we're starting with. Um, we actually did a little kind of promo video for it today to in honor of Earth Day. <laughs> um, so we're going to just start kind of getting the message out to folks to let them know that we're going to be starting it. And once we know exactly when it's going to be starting, we'll kind of follow up with more information. Um, and so I've talked with Mark and Cody and we talked about, you know, how could we maybe make this um, so not only for the city, I know Mark has some interest in kind of really making it a countywide effort and knowing that De Pere's already doing it now, Green Bay is on board. So um, unless anybody has any questions, I think I might let Mark kind of talk about that a little more. Sure. Sophia, and thanks, Corey. And Corey, I have to ask, did you, I talked to, um, or I emailed Scott Thorson at the city of De Pere, and he said they're actually on there. They've already gotten two benches because they re-registered six months, which was, okay. I didn't, Cody, you know, Cody and, and Corey and I met or, or talked about this. And um, Cody, I think we didn't know that that was a possibility. It, 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 we thought it was a one and done. Uh, so just in terms of my representation from the county, I'd like to, yeah, we'd definitely be supporting the city of Green Bay's efforts, but we also would like to look at a way of making it, a, um, extending it out to the county and making it a long-term type of program. Um, it's a great idea to go for the bench price donations, but once we get it going and just getting it moving forward, that'd be um, a long-term goal, um, at least through my department, through resource recy recycle, you know, recovery, making sure that we're keeping things out of recycling bins and um, seeing if we can get material or working with each each community or coalitions of communities to getting more benches around the county as well. Um, but definitely start out with supporting what uh, Corey's going to be doing through the city of Green Bay. Um, and as she said, yeah, we have at our household hazardous waste facility, we have a scale that'll easily weigh stuff up and it's kind of convenient. You drive driving to De Pere anyway to Festival Food to Cody. We're just going to pop in Cody's office and um, See where see where they go from there, but uh, certainly from my standpoint as a recycling educator and coordinator for recycling, plastic bags are our biggest issue overall in terms of just a lot of reasons. Um, you know, they're they're out into the environment. They're not recyclable curbside. They're they cause maintenance issues and environmental issues, and we just like to see them collected. We can't ban them in the state. State law prohibits that, but we can certainly do other things. And I think this is a, a really good program. So, you know, we can also potentially talk to some, um, Trex provides you with two bins for collections, what I understand. Um, and we can certainly talk to some other partners about getting more bins in different areas. Um, I think it would benefit, uh, I'll be talking to Troy struck about tomorrow. Um, the county's having an Earth Day event, uh, but um, see if, he'd want to have the northern building as a drop-off site let's say you know it's always convenient for people if they're coming from home to to drop off something uh, in the place they work so uh, certainly if there are more sites around the county that we could use that'd be great and then move it forward from there but uh, whatever help Corey and her team needs from us you know we're going to do it I, I'd just like to say uh, thank, thanks for Parks for stepping up and uh, the support county's given him. And, I, and when I really brought this forward, I was really hoping that it would be the state head to the county. That'd be fantastic. And uh, even though we might have to give up a bench or two uh, to the county, it's well worth it. So benches are nice, but uh, it's really collecting the, the plastic that really, you know, that's what counts. Awesome. Other questions on uh, on this? One other comment. We did, John, um, John Arndt had offered up the bags that have been collected at UWGB. Um, in our discussions, we kind of felt that we should be more straightforward. It'd be more, let's say, ethical to make sure we just are 
using what's collected within the time frame of the program. I also had thought about, hey, you know, we could collect, as we continue this program, if we um, collect things countywide, we could say, okay, put in another application for the, like the town of Humboldt and then actually collect on their behalf and bring it to them. But it, it doesn't seem right exactly. You know, we have to figure out, we have to figure out more of the ethics of how a program like, like that would work. It's, it's, it seems too much like um, we're trying to play the system more than we should. So, um, but, yeah, but it's I, something to, to further talk about. No, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, ultimately you want a successful program. So you've got to figure out how to launch that and to make it successful. You know, ideally, if you can get this into a sustainable format, um, I could see longer term where it might be easier for the university to use their collected bags and, and bring them to Brown County's program um, as, as a drop off site, because there's a lot of uh, work trying to get these things shipped out to Trex Direct. And it's, it's very, it's not for really any money. It's the, such a, a low amount of money mm -hmm. that there may be more convenience to continue collecting at the university, but ultimately using a sustainable Brown County system. Yeah, and for us, having a drop-off lo location, for example, at our offices on Broadway, we've already set that example in place in the past with the food waste program you know, it'd be slightly different, but we've got capacity on that site to store um, a lot of things. When, when you see the number of people dropping off hazardous waste and electronics on any given Thursday, plastic bags are a um, tiny little fraction of that. So uh, we'd be happy to serve as that next step, the collection site. So I think that'll work. I just like get thrown in at the ethics, uh, certainly for Green Bay, you know, we can start at, at, at scratch again. But I mean, I think as, as a program goes, I think, you know, like the idea of um, uh, providing, you know, humble with some bait. That, to me, I don't think that's an ethical. I think that or gaming the system. I think that's using the system as a tool. I think the ethics is to collect plastic. That should be the ultimate ethics we should be looking at and, and looking at this as a tool, uh, any way we could use it. To help that that's the ethical uh goal i want to focus on um so i don't look at it so much as gaming as as a tool to get the uh, ultimate ethic of collecting plastic bags my two cents yeah it was more that if we put in an application saying we are the town of humboldt collecting but we're actually collecting countywide and feeding into the town of humboldt that's but if brown county and it, talking to the peer that they've been able to continue this program because the original understanding was that it was a one and done with the bench. You know, you do six months, you get a bench, you're done. Um, you can continue to collect and send to, to Trex, but that, that you wouldn't get another bench. Um, however, like I said, De Pere's already on their second bench. Um, they're working on a third one. Um, you know, if we, if the county becomes an applicant, then it works out that we could do, you know, we've got 25 units of government in the county. Okay, well, so that's 12 and a half years of, of collecting of benches for each community in, in some ways. And yeah, it would be, uh, be a great way of, of getting one into each, each, yeah, each community. In the See, there's always some way you can spin it a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> I know we got some snow, but where are you, Julia? This is a little old picture. This is, uh, I'm in Green Bay. This is a picture from Green Bay about a month ago. Uh, it's Point Sable and the ice shove. <laughs> it's the Green Bay Glacier. Didn't you, haven't you heard of it? Here they all melted because of climate change. Uh, there's a still a little piece out there. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I drove through Wausau on Sunday, and you could still uh, all the ski runs still have snow on them. So, um, a little crazy. 
All right, well, cool. Um, thank you, Corey and, and Mark uh, and Randy for bringing this forward. Um, this is really exciting, appreciate this. And I, yeah, have a big uh, drawer full of plastic bags and I can't wait to get rid of them. <laughs> And, and, and Seth, maybe I we have, could have maybe Corey, you could video us all bringing our whole commission, bringing our plastic bags for a Facebook Live event for this the kickoff. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I also like the idea of kind of educating, using it, this initiative also as kind of an educational tool for because um, we did talk about more promo videos and like you know. Um, just endorsing people bringing their cloth bags, alternative ways of doing what you typically do to even reduce, you know, the use of that plastic as well as, yes, recycling what you do have, so. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to give um, a shout out, kudos to, to Corey and to Festival Foods because we couldn't do this without their willingness to, to accept, you know, to be the end. Um, and collection point for it. It just, that's one of the things we've always struggled with within the county is we can run programs to collect things and have people drop them off. But if we don't have a place to go with it, the program is going to fail. Festival food is going to be great. Um, I really appreciate that a lot. Awesome. Any other thoughts on this before moving on to item two? Alrighty then, item two, green infrastructure code project update. Uh, Melissa? So the noxious weeds and maintenance of vegetation um, code update, which is section 8.11, um, went through the INS committee uh, last week and it was approved with the amended changes um, lots of input from parks and forestry staff, as well as sustainability commission members and development team. Um, and then it was approved last night, the, the ordinance update or the, the code update for that one last night in council. So that one is on the books. Um, that's, that was the first one. So that's exciting. And um, the second one that is getting Oh, Melissa, would you mind just um, before you move on to the next one, could you just give like the two to three sentence, like what it says then? Or like, because well, I, I mean, the last it's a time four page heard... document. It's a four page <laughs> document. But if if you remember the, the commission, you all had comment period on it and some of the language that was recommended for, um, you know, the purpose of it with increasing habitat for pollinators, that was, you know, that was kept, that was added. Um, some of the, you know, the items that were maybe a little bit more controversial in nature, like um, a set size limit for planned natural landscapes, um, that was removed. Um, that was one, it was 5% of a lot, up to 5% of a lot, a lot size. Um, so that was removed. Um, most of the setbacks were kept intact. So the setbacks from the front lot line, you know, whether you have a sidewalk or not a sidewalk, those were kept. Um, the setback from the, the rear and side lot lines, if the property has a permitted fence, those setbacks were removed for planned natural landscapes. Um, and the required registration, that passed, that was kept in there and that passed. Um, what else? As far as noxious weeds, um, the, the, the DNR standard was kept in there. Um, we did remove some of the specific species that were called out um, within our current code. Um, it still is, is um, and that was for staff reasoning um, because the city really doesn't have a strong mechanism to enforce all removal of noxious weeds on its own land. So that was the, the staff recommendation and that passed. Um, trying to think what are some of the other like big highlighted ones. Um, Melissa, we added the no mow. 
definition. No mo, no mo, a no mo lawn or no mo grass. Um, that definition was added. Um, yeah, so those were those are the main things. It's um, a copy of that would be in the packet, um, public facing packet um, on the city's website. If you look under meetings and minutes, you can see that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was, it was, it, it's, it's an arduous process getting code amendments put in place. It's, you know, it's, so that one was the first one to go. The next one will be the landscaping ordinance, which is chapter 13. Um, so I've been working a lot with Dave Buck, who's still on the call here, um, and, uh, the planners and, and zoning in general on that, um, a lot of great feedback. Um, you know, the biggest changes that we're going to see with that are all the new definitions of the various types of green infrastructure added to the landscaping standards, and then changing some of the requirements for parking lot islands and parking lot medians when, when there's redevelopment or new development for parking lots. Resurfacing of parking lots, it won't apply to just resurfacing. Um, also, soil volume requirements for trees in those landscape in those landscape situations that is being specified with a defined amount of soil volume and that was with consultation with the forestry department um, and them providing white papers and all kinds of backup information you know these numbers aren't just grabbed from the sky um, and then yeah, so I mean that's kind of it in a nutshell. The the landscaping ordinance is already through the first level of law review, um, and the next step will be um, public public outreach. Before it goes to the plan commission, we are going to do some public outreach. Um, when that is going to take place, I'm not entirely sure yet. I I need to coordinate that with with Dave's team. Um, to coordinate that effort, but it will likely be reaching out to specific developers that do this type of work in the city of Green Bay so that we're really hitting our target audience. And then also, um, you know, business districts, like anywhere where we're going to see a lot of these potential um, projects and redevelopment projects coming through. And um, it'll be virtual, it'll probably be a Zoom format. Um, we'll do a Q&A. Um, we'll have myself there, the planners, um, a couple of planners there, hopefully, I, I would think. I mean, that's kind of where I'm going with this, Dave. And, um, and then we will probably invite our consultant. She has agreed to um, appear at either like a council meeting if need be or um, at, at a plan commission meeting as well. Um, so I don't know if we'll in, take her up on the offer for the public forum because we really don't have any money to spend on her. She, she was, she's just agreed to do like one, one appearance. So, um, and go through the reasoning. So Dave, I have my memo drafted that I'm gonna send you next week for the plan commission. So I'm kind of getting that card ahead of the horse, but that was easy to knock out. The public outreach takes more time. So, um, so that's the next one. The other update is that the, the city is in the process of re um, codifying the entire municipal code. So what that means is that all the numbers are going to change. Chapter 13 is not going to be chapter 13 anymore. Stormwater is not going to be chapter 30. Noxious weeds isn't going to have the same number. So we're holding off a little bit on running, running forward this too quickly because all the numbers are going to change. So we really want to make sure that, the, that it gets recodified first and then it goes to plan commission and then it goes to council. So it kind of builds in the time for the public outreach. Questions? What kind of action are you looking for on this item? Well, nothing right now. This is just for your information. Oh, I, I thought it said with possible action. I don't think so. No, this was, I just had this under informational. There's no action on this. This is just so that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Never mind. Uh, 
Um, I don't think I have any more updates with that. And then I'm meeting, I've been meeting with um, staff on the stormwater, the stormwater ordinance and going through some of those comments right now too, just internally. So that's all I have guys. Awesome. Well, thank you, Melissa. It's exciting updates. Uh, we'll move on then to uh, committee updates and, and uh, other project updates from members. Bueller. This isn't very much of an update, but we're at my the graduate students at UW Madison. I'm still working with them with the forestry department for the urban tree canopy work and goal. Um, and so we are starting to look at, you know, what are like the actual next steps and what kind of data would we need? And um, I think their plan might be even to. So and what kind of, so if we needed to go, you know, try to maybe get a grant to do that data analysis or that could be done at a graduate student level, we'll see. But that's kind of where we're at at that. Like we, there's definitely, you need a baseline and some more information. And I know the for, Tierney's still been working with the forestry department in general for helping them do more city specific tree work and inventory, um, but we like city property and city owned trees, but we're really gonna focus on, on uh, like a citywide canopy goal to an analysis. So that's just slowly moving along, I guess is my point. I'd like to know if the county's planning on bringing back the compostable program at all someday soon over the rainbow, Mark? <laughs> Any update on that? No, we don't have a, a a collection or hauler that's that's working. Santa Max is out of the business. The other company that does a lot of this um, on an institutional level is called um, uh, Organics, uh, and they're out of Illinois, Central Illinois. But they take all their compostable material to feedlots, and in Wisconsin, that's not allowed under current law. You can't you can't take waste food and feed animals with it in Wisconsin. Um, it's not, so we'd have to change that law at the state. We could do that kind of program um, with food waste. Um, so we're still, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. There are a, a couple of uh, nonprofit private enterprises that are um, working towards programs in our area. Uh, Farmer Donna has been doing collections. She's in, out of Crivets, has an organic farm out of Crivets, and she's been doing collections in De Pere and Green Bay on a subscription basis for people. Um, and there's a company, a nonprofit out of Sheboygan that's been focusing on Southeast Wisconsin a little bit. And they reached out to us about a month ago um, asking about the possibility of doing a program in the Green Bay area, but they don't have a local farm uh, to cooperate with that, that will work uh, that program will work with very well. So it, it'll, it'll happen, Randy, eventually. I'm optimistic, um, but it won't be the same, the same form as what we had. Um, I think it'll be more of a one-to-one um, -one basis with a, a nonprofit or, or for-profit enterprise. Uh, Compost Crusaders in Milwaukee is, is a for-profit enterprise, though barely for profit, <laughs> but still, uh, she does a great job down there. So yeah, there we'll still, we're, we're still working at it. Other updates from folks? The only other update I would mention is on the recycling green events, um, if I can, yeah. The county's holding something tomorrow that I was told I had to be at. I'm not sure what it is in con conjunction with Earth Day and the Aldo Leopold School. Um, uh, not sure exactly what that's going to be for sure, but uh, there is a, an Earth Day event sponsored by Brown County tomorrow. Um, and then, and I think, Seth, you're, I saw you're, you guys have a booth at the uh, 
the Go Green event at Titletown. And the city of Green Bay is actually going to be part of that um, as well. They're going to have a recycling truck parked at Lambeau Field uh, across the street from Hinterland. Uh, with the the Tri-County Recycling System will have a booth up there as well um, for educational purposes for anybody who wants to know about recycling and wants to ask questions. So um, trying to get the, the word out there about what you can and can't do. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how it functions. It's, they've never done this before. Looked where it's set up. That's where I noticed the conservation voters has a booth set up there too. So is that you, Seth? Uh, Wisconsin conservation voters or WeGov conservation voters? Uh, good question. I'd have to go back and look. People, we're technically two separate organizations, but people mix it up all the time. So that's, we'll be there. It's probably us. Is there a nationalist presence here? I have a quick update um, is this probably just relates to everybody, but also to the climate. Um, I can, I don't even know the name of that subgroup Seth. that you and John, is it climate action subgroup or? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's like okay. a. So we're still moving ahead with the energy, um, continuing um, energy star benchmarking. Um, of some other city facilities, uh, the, the students in the energy management program from NWTC are doing that. Um, I've been sending them data. Um, John also was part is part of that as well. And um, so they're using it as a teaching tool and we get the benefit of having students do data entry for the city of Green Bay, which is fantastic. And um, the other thing that's happening with um, one of the students in that program is, um, they're gonna do a solar site assessment for the city. Um, it's part of his final project, this, this particular student. So we selected the park shop on the west side as a potential site. Um, and it would be a roof mounted system. So he's just gonna do a site assessment to determine the potential for energy production. Um, and you know he goes through a whole process and he's gonna write a report and he'd like to report back to our committee or to you know whoever in the city that wants to hear his report which i would think would be us and um and i consulted with the city engineers on building on the roof because i think rooftop is really our greatest potential for solar unfortunately a lot of the roofs need repair or replacement so those should not be first on the list for getting solar just because the repair needs to happen before we start putting solar panels on top of roofs. So, um, so yeah, so that's happening next Wednesday. I have just a few things I think you might be interested in. Um, I know the Bear Creek Preservation Foundation is doing a volunteer um, effort at in the Greenway. I believe they're meeting at Triangle Hill between 8.30 and noon this coming Saturday. So if you wanna spread the word um, to go help, I think do invasive removal and that sort of thing in honor of Earth Day. Um, also, there's gonna be a grad student doing um, some research in the Bear Creek Greenway and going to be collecting bumblebees to study pollination in spring ephemerals. So that's kind of an interest. She's doing it in other locations too throughout the state. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting. I'm hoping she'll share her research <laughs> just to see what she's learned. Um, so I thought that would be interesting to share. And then also coming up on Monday, April 26th, um, there is an unveiling of a sculpture in the city. And it's, let's see. At 11 o'clock um, at 930 Harvey Street, which I think is, um, it's behind like where the Metro transfer station is. Um, there'll be an unveiling of the sculpture. It's kind of also helping to celebrate pollinators. And um, I don't know if I can say what the sculpture is. I think it's there, you can probably drive by it, but. <laughs> The official unveiling is coming up on Monday. So um, if you're in the neighborhood, take a look at it. I can tell you what it is. 
<laughs> the, you're talking about the one by the transit? Yes. It's up now. You can drive past. Okay. <laughs> it's very, it's very nice looking. I really like it. If you want to know what it is, I'll tell you, but I think you should go past and check it out. Spoiler alert. Sorry. <laughs> I just can't keep a secret. <laughs> that wouldn't be the skull. It, it, um, I had talked to a, an artist, a sculptor out of Milwaukee last year, late last year, uh, who was putting together a sculpture for, for the city made out of recycled plastic bottles. Um, it's, not, it's not that one, but that one will be coming up soon too. Good. I, I, wouldn't, I didn't know what the status was. It took quite a while to actually find, source what he was looking for um, that would work for his, his project. But that one I thought was going to be over like near the old, where the Children's, Children's Museum used to be closer to the downtown area. Yeah, I think that's where it is, or it might be on, uh, might be on Bodart. I'm not sure exactly okay, where it is, but know. I've seen it. It's probably 90% completed. It, it is, okay. That is really cool too. And yes, made of plastic bottles, primarily bottles, so recycled, reused. Yep. All right, other updates? I just have one quick. I was uh, invited to participate in a press conference earlier today um, with uh, Mayor Genrick, uh, Representative Shelton, and Lieutenant Governor Barnes and uh, Noah from Citizen Action to highlight some of the work that we've done. So thank you all for doing a bunch of uh, cool stuff that I was able to, to touch on and, and really call for, you know, in, in honor of it being Earth Week and Earth Day, call for, for more action on addressing climate change and, and ask uh, state and federal elected leaders to do the same. So maybe you'll see us on the news. Who knows? There was a, a couple cameras there. Um, and then, yeah, looking forward to that um, event uh, that Mark mentioned uh, at uh, Title Town District in a couple weeks here. We're going to have like a, a panel with, um... John, are you going to be on that too, I think, or were you out of town? We have some we have some good folks that are going to be talking about some of the local work happening in Green Bay and, and uh, elsewhere in the region too. So you won't want to miss it. Yeah, I will be up. Uh, but I did do recently a, a climate change panel for uh, the folks at Leadership Green Bay. So shared uh, what some of what we've been working on uh, here, as well as uh, pointed out the solar array at Light Park for everybody, which was just happened to be across the parking lot. Uh, and then briefly mentioned uh, what we had planned for the fire stations, which I, I couldn't give them any detail on that because I don't know any detail on that. It's happening. Fire station number five, the engineering calcs are being done um, by city staff to calculate the weight load, but the um, it's it's it should be done late this spring. And, and Jesse from um, Elon Electric was on leadership meeting in the afternoon, the same one I was on, and he talked about uh, the status of those solar panel installations. So, yeah, I was I was on one of those too that that afternoon. So I was a crew um, all day, and I know my coworker Casey was as well to talk about the county. So just tons of great local action happening on on climate and energy here. Other updates before we uh, move on. All right, next meeting, May 19th. Uh, see you all in a month. And that brings us to adjournment. Is there Adjourn. a motion? Randy, seconded by? A second. Julia. By Julia. All those in favor to adjourn, say aye. Aye. And those opposed, say nay. <laughs> the ayes have it. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Seth, you'll get to see me tomorrow morning if you watch WLUK. I'm doing a their morning show talking about Earth Day, and then I'll be talking to WBAY at the county's event about Earth Day.